So, I don't know how many of you have read a lot of the philosopher Plato. I assume probably most of you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Plato is one of those people that he's, he really is one of the most influential thinkers in all of the Western world. So, even, uh, you know, his ideas are so pervasive that even if you've never read anything he wrote or don't know much of anything about him, you probably have been influenced by him in ways you don't even realize. Um, he's just a, a very important per person in the kind of Western way of thinking. And one of his most famous works is called The Republic. Uh, and it was written as a dialogue between Plato's brother Glaucon and his mentor Socrates. And in the book, Socrates offers... Um, a pretty famous illustration that's known as the allegory of the cave. How many of you have heard of that before, the allegory of the cave? Okay, so uh, this, the allegory of the cave, it's, again, it's very interesting. It's actually an idea that has influenced a lot of literature and things like that um, throughout the years. And it, and it kind of goes like this. This is just a probably pretty lousy synopsis of the allegory of the cave. So there's a group of prisoners who live their entire lives chained up inside of a cave facing a blank wall. And their entire perception of the world is based on shadows projected onto that blank wall by puppets that are made to pass uh, in front of a fire that's behind the prisoners. So you get it. You can kind of visualize that. There's a fire behind the prisoners. There's people with, like, puppets making them move around in front of the fire, and it's projecting an image on, on the wall. Uh, and that's all that the, the prisoners know about the world. And then in the allegory, one of the prisoners is released. And when he turns around and, and sees the fire that's behind him for the first time, the light, uh, it, it kind of, it's blinding to him. It's painful. His eyes hurt. And so he turns back, um, choosing instead to remain in the cave. And there are there, people there trying to explain to him that there's a world outside of the cave, but he doesn't want to believe that. He doesn't want to accept that. And so eventually they kind of forcibly, forcibly drag him out of the cave. And once they do that, slowly his eyes begin to adjust to the light. Eventually the pain subsides and eventually he's able to kind of incrementally uh, see things outside of the cave. First, he's able to look into water and see the reflection of things and people in the water. And then later on, he's able to look at the moon and the stars. And, and then finally, he comes to where he is able to see things directly in the light of the sun. And he comes to believe, as one would, I'm sure, that life outside of the cave is superior to life inside of the cave. And so, having that knowledge, he will now want to go and share this revelation with the remaining prisoners. But he will find that upon returning to the cave, since his eyes have adjusted to sunlight and life outside of the cave, he can now, he's unable to see inside of the cave. And when he, so when he's there and he's unable to see and the other prisoners realize that, and there he is, he's trying to convince the remaining prisoners that there is a life outside of the cave and it's better than the one inside of the cave, well, they, they won't believe him and will instead wish to remain in the cave, staring at the shadows on the wall. He may even convince them to turn around and look at the fire. And when they do, and it, and it hurts their eyes and it blinds them, once again, they would prefer to remain in the cave. Because making any kind of uh, change that they might have to make, you know, like for them, leaving the cave is a lot like what it's like for us to change. Change is often um, something that happens through struggle it's difficult. It can be painful at, time and, at times. And so they would prefer to just remain in the dim, flickering light of that cave. Now, that's basically how the allegory goes. Um, we'll leave it there rather than getting into the deep philosophical discussion that can kind of go along with it. But we will tie that back in later. For now, let me let you know what our scripture for today is. It's Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 29. So that again was Luke 20, verses 27 
through 29. If you'd like to turn in your Bible so you can follow along, that's a great idea. Uh, and remember, if you if you if someone maybe at home and YouTube Live or wherever who doesn't know how to uh, find Luke in the gospel or in, in the Bible, rather, there's a table of contents that's always a great a great resource. All right, let's hear our scripture today. Some Sadducees, those who say there is no resurrection, came to him. Uh, him meaning Jesus, of course, and asked him a question. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaving a wife but no children, the man shall marry the widow and raise up children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first married and died childless. Then the second and the third married her. And so in the same way, all seven died childless. Finally, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had married her. Jesus said to them, Those who belong to this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of a place in that age and in the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Indeed, they cannot die any more because they are like angels. Notice he says like angels, not angels. They are like angels and are children of God, being children of the resurrection. And the fact that the dead are raised, Moses himself showed. In the story about the bush where he speaks of the Lord as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now he is God not of the dead, but of the living. For to him, all of them are alive. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him another question. Amen. Well, in our sermon series in Luke, we have now come to the third and final story in which Jesus is posed questions by those who are opposed to him while he's there in the temple. Up until now, we've been told that it was the chief priests and the scribes who were questioning Jesus. And the scribes do make a, a brief appearance in today's scripture as well. But we are told uh, at the beginning of our scripture for today that it is the Sadducees now who are doing the questioning. And that actually serves as an important reminder to us that Judaism in the first century as today as uh, is true of I'm sure most major religions uh, today. Well, Judaism in the first century was not monolithic. There were several different sects, and these different sects, they interpreted the scripture differently from one another. They practiced Judaism differently from one another. The Sadducees were, were a priestly class, and they were an aristocratic group of, uh, of practicing Jews at the time. And they considered their holy text only the first five books of what we call the Old Testament. They didn't, they, they didn't use, you know, the Psalms. They didn't use the prophets, anything like that. Just those first five books of the Old Testament. And they did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in the idea that God would one day raise from the dead those whom God judged righteously. And we can contrast them with another group um, that's often named in the gospel tradition, the Pharisees. The Pharisees, they did include the prophets, um, what they called the writings in their scriptures. So their holy text would have consisted of something more closely resembling what we call the Old Testament. And the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection, which, of course, is what the New Testament also teaches. It teaches that sort of the Pharisees' idea of resurrection just with a bit of a Christian twist on it. Easter, when God raised Jesus from the dead, serves as God's sign of good faith that what God did for Jesus on Easter, God will one day do for all creation. And on that day, Jesus will judge with righteousness and equity and those raised and deemed faithful in Christ will be blessed with eternal life under the reign of God. And so that's sort of the uh, position that uh, 
you know, the Pharisees held an idea similar to that. Jesus, when he came preaching the gospel, put a Christian twist on that idea. And that's what we find in the New Testament. Although what Jesus is teaching here, ironically, I uh, started with a platonic allegory. Um, but what Jesus teaches here contrasts with the uh, platonic idea of a disembodied, immortal soul, an idea that is pretty pervasive in Western Christianity uh, today, even though it's really not what the Scripture teaches, interestingly enough. Um, we don't need to say much more about that. If you'd like to know more about that, though, I actually preached an entire sermon series on that idea. Uh, at the end of our series on 1 Corinthians, it would have been kind of in the spring of 2022. All of those sermons are still available on our YouTube channel, um, so you can go back and look for those if you'd like to know more about that. And I can also point you to a really interesting book that I've talked a ton about from the pulpit, but it's still a really good read, and if you've never read it, I still high re highly recommend it. It's a book called Surprised by Hope by N.T. Wright. Um, Truly an excellent book. So, something that I really should point out about this, this gospel story that we've heard this, mor this morning, and, and kind of also looking back to the last couple that we've studied, is that uh, in, in the last couple of stories when Jesus is in the temple and he's got a question posed to him, well, he kind of dodges those questions, or he gives vague answers that are open to interpretation. And he kind of has to do that, because the questions posed to him are not being asked in earnest. The inquisitors don't genuinely want to hear Jesus' answers. Rather, they are questions that are meant to cause Jesus to say something publicly that would be considered seditious or blasphemous so that they would have a grounds to hand him over to the authorities. The, this exchange with the Sadducees in our scripture for today, though, is a bit different. Jesus has more freedom to discuss this topic openly. There's, you know, a lot of people in Judaism believed in the resurrection. So he would not be considered blasphemous if he was discussing this topic openly. And so he explains to the Sadducees that their question isn't really valid because it's based on a misunderstanding of what life following the resurrection will be like, will be like, rather. The faithful who are raised will never die again. And so many of the concerns of the present age will no longer be concerns. So again, the Sadducees' question is based on a misunderstanding. And so Jesus gives them an actual answer to their question, and a good one. Nonetheless, and I could be wrong about this, but I really get a sense from reading this story that the Sadducees, they, like the others who were questioning Jesus, were not asking this question because they, they were truly interested in hearing what Jesus had to say on the topic of resurrection. I get a sense that they weren't asking this question with a genuine desire to learn from Jesus' answer. Instead, they were probably just looking for an opportunity to argue their stance on the topic of resurrection. They were probably looking for an opportunity to sort of just double down on what they already believed about the topic. And I, I say that because of the fact that their line of argument is a, a whataboutism. There might be a better word for that, but... Um, I think maybe you kind of know what I mean. You know, th so what they did is they said, oh, you believe in the resurrection. Well, what about this ridiculous scenario where a woman has seven husbands? Dot, dot, dot. It's my experience that, that whataboutisms are sometimes helpful. Sometimes they can help somebody to consider something that they had not previously considered. Um, that might be kind of legitimate. But I think more, more frequently, I, found, I find whataboutisms to be a little disingenuous. 
Frequently using a whataboutism is like saying, I can't or I don't want to actually argue your point. So instead, I'm just going to try to tip you, trip you up on some technicality, something like that. And that's what I feel like the Sadducees are doing here. And when it doesn't work, then all of a sudden they're like, well, we don't want to talk to Jesus anymore. It says we don't dare, we, they didn't dare to ask any more questions which is kind of like the, um, the debate version of the old, you know, pickup basketball game thing where a play doesn't go your way and you're like, well, I'm taking my ball and going home. Um, that's kind of what, you know, when, when Jesus shut down their line of argument, they're just like, fine, we don't want to ask you any more questions. Taking their ball and going home. But generally speak, speaking, people are much more comfortable having what they already assume about something confirmed, then they are actually being challenged in their views and facing the possibility that they may need to adjust their thinking on a particular topic. It's hard for people, um, myself included, uh, certainly, to, uh, to realize that you might have been wrong about something. Today's world is full of opportunities uh, for people to have their... Uh, beliefs about something confirmed. Maybe you've heard the expression confirmation bias. It's an expression that's used a lot in today's idiom. Uh, and what confirmation bias is, is it's where a person will deliberately seek out information that is consistent with what they already believe or deliberately interpret information in a way that is supportive of what they already believe. And it's frustrating to be in a discussion with someone or to be asked a question by someone who isn't genuinely interested in hearing what you have to say. And so it's very gracious of Jesus that he actually does answer the question. He could have easily just sort of saw their, their motives and kind of perceived that this was not a, a, a really genuine question. And he could have just done what he had done previously to, to kind of save his hide, and he could have just dodged the question. Instead, he, he actually gives them an answer. He takes the time to discuss the topic of resurrection. And I'll tell you something. I don't envy the Sadducees in this story. Because think about what happened here. To reiterate, they came to Jesus with a question meant to trip him up and prove their point rather than out of a genuine desire to learn from Jesus. Nonetheless, Jesus gives them an answer. And this means that the, the Sadducees had an opportunity to have a genuine, life-giving conversation with God's loving, reconciling self-revelation. Granted, they may, may not have recognized Jesus as such, as the son of the living God, but even still, if they had been just a little less sure of themselves, a little more receptive and genuine in their dealings with others, imagine what they could have gained from this moment with Jesus. giving us just a minute to think about that. Instead, they're like those other prisoners in the cave, unwilling to believe that there is a whole world outside of the cave. Even when one of their own is sharing his own experience of that world with them, the light hurts their eyes. The adjustment period would be difficult and painful so instead, they prefer the dim, shadowy, small life in the cave. So we've covered this in depth today, but remember how the Sadducees in our scripture today behaved. Right? They came to Jesus asking a question disingenuously. They weren't, weren't really interested in, 
and hearing what Jesus had to say or learning from this experience. Do you know who it is that I see behaving that way a lot in their interactions with other people? Christians. I see Christians acting that way a lot today. And so I wonder what lesson we can take from this story. One of the things that uh, people outside of the Christian faith are, are sort of uh, most critical of Christians for today is the fact that we don't respect other people's faiths and other people's faith traditions. We aren't willing it to enter into dialogue with them. Or if we do, it's only because we are looking for the opportunity to state our beliefs and to sort of uh, proselytize. In other words, try to get them to come over to our side. And um, granted, not, not all Christians are like that, certainly. But there is a reason that that is people's perception of Christians in today's world. And because of that, people are less and less interested in engaging in conversation with, with Christians. I'll tell you a, a story. I w- was in seminary, and uh, I spent a lot of time in, study, in seminary studying other faith traditions. Um, and then, uh, in 2016, I went with a group of Bible quizzers, uh, Free Methodist Bible quizzers, to Seattle, Uh, We spent a a few days at uh, Seattle Pacific University, a free Methodist institution, um, for the the national championships of Bible quizzing. And um, we relied a lot on public transportation while we were there, so I... We were making our way back to the airport. We had to take like two buses and a train to get there. So we're on the train on the way to the airport, and I strike up a conversation with uh, Gretchen and I are there, and we we strike up a conversation with uh, a young lady on the train next to us, and it turns out that she's a Mormon. And uh, Mormons, like when they're when they reach adulthood, uh, they go on mission, which is like if you've ever seen the the guys riding around on the bikes, kind of going door to door, that's what they're doing. They're on, they're on mission. It's sort of like a rite of passage that they go through. And girls uh, have the option to either do that or to marry at that age. And so I asked her, I said, so she, told, she shared, I think, that she had just graduated from high school. And so I asked, oh, okay, are you going on mission? And she was like, you know about that? And I was like, yeah, sure, you know, tell me a little bit about it. And um, so we had a really nice discussion, and we wound up actually talking about uh, eschatology, which is the branch of theology that deals with, like, the end times. And it was a neat conversation, and it was like, you know, uh, in that conversation, I took the time to focus on how our beliefs are similar rather than why yours are wrong and you should believe the way I believe. And I'll tell you what, I bet that that conversation stuck with her more than probably a number of conversations she's had with other Christians where they've just spent their time trying to convince her that she's wrong and that she should change her way of thinking. Tell you another story. Um, I have a a colleague, and and she's a a friend of mine who pastors a church in another denomination. And um, she has, has tried to partner with some of the other faith leaders in her community. Because good things happen when faith communities partner together, right? So like, for instance, Churches in Mission, um, which is, you know, one of the, as far as I know, it's the only uh, organization in Morgan County that does what they do. Um, It was founded because members of different faith communities came together and, and um, collaborated, you know, and brought that about. So, so good things happen when faith communities cooperate. Um, and I have, a, I have a colleague who uh, is trying to do that in, in the town that, where she pastors, um, but she can't get anywhere because several of the pastors in her community don't want anything to do with her because they don't believe in the idea of um, women in ordained ministry. And and so they think that uh, they think that she is a uh, you know like she's uh, I don't know heretical she's not biblical, 
Um, when, you know, of course, I would have a much easier time making a biblical argument in favor of uh, women in ministry. In fact, I've made that argument um, from the pulpit many times. And so um, the way I look at that is what good could be being done in that community that is not being done in that community because of some disagreement on a minor point of doctrine. I'm reminded of a, a, a quote from the book of James, and I'm doing this from memory, and so I'm sorry if I um, quote it uh, not precisely, but James writes that the spirit of true religion is this, advocate for the orphan and widow and love your neighbor. In the allegory of the cave, you don't want to be the people who stubbornly refuse to leave the cave. And so I think that when we interact with others as Christians, we need to remember that. And we need to remember the lesson that we can learn from the behavior of the Sadducees and our scripture for today, who had an opportunity to learn from God's loving, reconciling self-revelation, but were so sure of themselves that they missed out on that opportunity. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we, we're just so grateful for the fact that you love us and that you give us grace. Uh, we know, Lord, that we need it. Um, we just ask, Lord, that in your love and grace that you continue to um, convict us by the power of your Holy Spirit, correct us, guide us, draw us nearer to you, and um, show us, Lord, how we can be reconcilers in our community and in our world. And show us how we can just honor that spirit of true religion to, to advocate for those who are treated as others, who are marginalized, who are voiceless, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.